Good morning. Welcome to Crossroads. We're glad to have you with us this morning. Unfortunately, due to some technical issues, we don't have the recording of worship. Uh, but what we do have is myself and my guitar, because it's really late Saturday. Uh, so this is, uh, this is all I got for you. Thank you, Mike and team, for the uh, for most excellent time of worship. Please bow your heads with me for prayer. 
Dear Lord, thank you for this chance to worship you on this Sunday morning. That uh, Thank you for bringing us to- together today, God, virtually. Thank you for the most excellent weather that we've had over, over the past week. And uh, we just thank you and praise you for the gift of your son and for the grace that you've extended to us, God. I pray that you would bless the, uh, the message that, that we're about to share, God, and that uh, you would help it to reach hearts and touch lives, God, that you would bring us a little closer to you and help guide us as we move forward. Help, help us to, uh, to move closer to your will um, through the course of the message and through the course of the day. In your name I pray, amen. Now we have a message from the Caezas with uh, Wyclef Bible Ministries in Orlando. Greetings, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. This is Rick and Betsy Keyes of Serving with Wycliffe Bible Translators. We are continually praying for you and for the church and praying that uh, all is well and with you. Uh, recently, we've been asked to share with you some of the things we've learned about COVID during a period of COVID-19. I recently was preparing for a men's Bible study and I asked the guys what verse God has given them this week, and one guy replied, uh, John eleven thirty five. Of course, that's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. But it made me ponder of other times when Jesus could have cried, and I found another verse in John, excuse me, Luke uh, 19, uh, 41 and 42. This is a time when Jesus was preparing for his final approach to Jerusalem. And it says, as we, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would happen and what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Yes, we are uh, struggling with the unknown. Uh, God is weeping over this world and those who are, are tremendously fearful of this virus and those who have uh, gone before us to the Lord and passed because of the virus. And there's much hurting, there's unrest, there's injustice, unbelief. Um, um, but we, um, thinking that we have the good news, that we have the good news of Jesus Christ coming to this earth, dying on the cross and rising as, as the first of us to follow in his footsteps and in his, uh, his will. With all the hurt and uncertainty these days, um, I can get frozen thinking about what I should do in these situations. But God has comforted me uh, with a couple of verses. One is Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I really sense that each decision I make, I need to apply that verse and really um, find God to be uh, with me wherever I go. We pray that God will encourage you to know that He is weeping over you because He loves you and cares for you very much. He's called you to share the good news with others that are blind and hurting. This seems overwhelming at times, but He commands you to be strong and courageous. If you pray for help, he will protect your heart and mind with peace. So thank you for letting us share the good news with you. May the Lord give you hope and peace. So I mentioned we were having some technical issues, right? Because normally I would not be the one doing this. Regardless, parking lot praise will be happening again tonight at 6 p.m. Food donations will be collected, uh, so please bring non-perishable food items. Uh, You should have received a survey this week uh, to help us understand your take on our reopening plans, so please return those to us as soon as you can so that we can make informed decisions. FX uh, will be happening next Sunday, August 30th at 5.30 p.m., so kids have a fantastic time. And there are two primary ways uh, you can give to our ministries here at Crossroads. Uh, Number one, through our website, crossroadcny.org slash giving. Or you can always send us a check in the mail. And we thank you so much for your generous giving. It really allows us to uh, keep our ministries going here at Crossroads. 
So today, uh, we have a guest preacher, Matt Sheen, uh, our very own groups guy, uh, will be giving the message. So without further ado, Matt, take it away. Well, as you've noticed, I'm not Pastor Mick. I am Matt Sheen, the groups guy here at, uh, at Crossroads, and I get to uh, speak to you today. We're starting a new sermon series um, titled Crossroads, Our DNA. So we are looking at uh, exactly who we are as a body and who we are as a church overall. So the uh, first thing we're going to talk about is our mission. Our mission, as I'm sure you are aware of, as you've heard before when we're here and you see it on our website and every place else, that our mission is bringing Christ's compassion to people at the crossroads of life. It sounds really nice, but it's way more than just a catchy slogan or anything like that. This has been part of who we are as Christians and who we are as Crossroads since the very beginning of this fellowship. We are meant to be examples and to follow what Jesus did, follow his example in the world. We're to seek out and engage those who are hurting, those who are poor, those who are confused, anyone out there who is facing a difficult time in life, we're meant to be focusing our efforts on bringing them to us, to God through us. We're supposed to use God's power in our lives and the resources of truth, his word and his presence in our lives to bring the message to them. But it's very important that yes, this is our mission statement and this is who we are, but it's not something congratulatory. We can't pat ourselves in the back and say, hey, good job guys, you did it. This is a constant move that we must be making towards others. The only way to bring Christ's compassion is to actively engage with those around us. So it's important that we move in that direction all the time. In order to truly understand this mission statement, it's important that we kind of break it down. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, the concept of compassion. Compassion is a word that uh, it may get tossed around a lot in day-to-day -day lives. Um, and a lot of times it's seen as syn synonymous with a few other terms. So I want to uh, define our terms. First, compassion means to suffer with. If we go way, way back to word origins, as you guys probably are aware that in my uh, outside life, I'm, I'm an English teacher, but I'm not, I'm not that English teacher who's here to correct your grammar or anything like that. But I, but I am here to look at the subtle nuances of meaning in words and everything like that. I love doing that. And so compassion means to suffer with. Way back in its most ancient forms, that's exactly what it was about. It was about to suffer, suffering with another. Our second word is sympathy. Sympathy means literally fellow feeling. But if you look it up in the dictionary, it says the feelings of pity and sorrow for someone else's misfortune. Empathy literally means in feeling. It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So we have these three words. They all mean something about emotion, feeling with others and that type of thing. But uh, there's something really, really special about the word compassion. Compassion isn't the literal translation of essentially anything in the Bible. When we're looking at verses that have the word compassion in them, there are a few different Greek words that, uh, that can be translated as compassion, but the one that is most often translated as compassion is pronounced splachnizomai. Now I spent this past spring taking Greek, so I'm reasonably confident in my, uh, in my pronunciation, and I didn't translate it myself. I, I used the internet, I used Strong's Concordance, I, I used all my, my learning to get there. But to translate the word splachnizomai in Greek, it actually be, means to be moved to the deepest parts of one's body. Literally, it means to be moved to one's bowels. At one point in time, way back in, in Jesus' day, the seed of the emotions, particularly those emotions that had to do with love and pity, was seen as our deepest guts. So when we're talking about being moved to the deepest parts of our, of our body to, 
to really understand those deepest feelings that we have, those gut feelings, we're talking about the concept that is most closely related to what we call compassion. So knowing that these three terms are often interchangeable when we speak them, I think it's important that we kind of separate them. First, we'll go from bottom to top here, empathy. Empathy is most directly related to understanding the concept of me knowing exactly what you're feeling, of me being able to identify, understand it, and sense in myself what that feeling would be like. Sympathy is me looking at you and essentially feeling sorry for the feelings that you are having. I may be able to feel some sorrow with you because usually when we're talking about sympathy, we're talking about things that have to do with grief or pain, suffering, that type of thing. But sympathy is more about having that fellow feeling with you. I can feel it, you can feel it. Empathy again, I understand it and I can get that same sense with you. Sympathy, you feel it, I feel it. Compassion takes it to a whole nother level. What compassion does is when, we, when the feelings in me become the feelings that are deep in my guts, I feel for you, probably some sympathy and some empathy as well, but compassion is this feeling deep in my gut, deep, deep inside of me that feels for your hurt, for your loss, feels pity, feels love, all those things. Probably when we, uh, when we talk about teenagers falling in love, that initial gut feeling has something much more to do with splachnitzomai than the things that we would tend to use English to describe. So when we're talking about the inner parts of ourselves, those, those deepest feelings, that's what we're doing when we're talking about compassion. In the scriptures, we have uh, several different examples of the term compassion. First, when Matthew's writing of Jesus's everyday ministry, he writes, and Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What Jesus is feeling at this point is the deep guttural, guttural reaction for the lostness of his sheep. The pain and helplessness moved Jesus deeply, down to the deepest, the seat of his emotion. And at that point, right after this, he calls upon his disciples, he calls upon his followers to pray that God will send workers out into the harvest because the harvest is plentiful, but there are so few people that are willing to go forth and do the work of harvesting. Our next example is Mark 6, 34. It says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. So in this case, we have Jesus preparing to feed the 5,000. He's moved deeply to the very core of himself and rather than telling his disciples to pray in, in this instance, to seek out laborers for the harvest, he gives a rock solid example of what he wants us to do. To be a shepherd to the sheep, to teach, to get alongside people, to actually react in a way that is pulling people closer to God and guiding them to where they're supposed to be. Jesus continually experiences this deep emotion. In Mark 8, 2 and 3, Jesus is feeding the 4,000 and to the exact, in the exact same sense as in previous verses, he feels this word, the, the word translated is splachnitzomai again, the guttural feelings from the core towards the lost sheep, towards the lost ones in, in the world. And he reaches out again to them, to be with them, to teach them, to help them, to try and guide them on the path that will bring them closer to God through him. Paul also is able to express this concept. 
He calls upon all of Jesus' followers to understand the compassion of Christ and to demonstrate the same actions and affections that Christ shows. In 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 4, it says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. In verses six and seven, there, it, it continues by saying, though, speaking of Christ, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So here we have the word, splachnitzomai is actually the translation or the root word um, for splachnitzomai is where it says affection. We're talking not necessarily just the feeling of, we're talking about the actual, that emotion itself. So when we're talking about the affection, it's the affection that you feel deep down in your gut to the very deepest part of ourselves and in humility count others more significantly more significantly than yourself. Jesus stepped down from the on high God position to be born as a man. And through that, we were able to be bridged to God the Father through Jesus' death, through the grace extended to us. And the idea that this gut feeling was at the core of it, that Jesus felt deep inside him this love and this pity that was trying to forever bring us back to him. It's powerful stuff. And the idea that Jesus brought himself down to us to get messy, to walk beside us, to be with us, to teach us exactly how we are supposed to be, and perfect example. That I guess I start to feel that same emotion deep in my gut. There are moments when I can sit and think about it and just be completely overwhelmed by the sacrifice, beyond, even beyond just the sacrifice on the cross, not that that is something small, but the sacrifice of becoming man, of spending a life with us when he was so far higher than us. And I guess probably the closest thing that I can ever truly understand with that type of thing is looking at my own child and thinking of the things that I would be willing to, to sacrifice and give and understanding at the same time that that compassion, that deep gut feeling isn't, I mean, it's not even a minuscule representation of what God and Jesus felt for us. So we've covered the concept of compassion. Now to talk about the idea of the crossroads of life. For me, this concept is, uh, is one that my heart is particularly soft to. I am so incredibly thankful for Christ's compassion and that it was extended to all of us especially in the most difficult times that we've had. Years ago, I had a mentor who, over the course of his life, faced some difficult times. He grew up with vague ideas about the desirability of a relationship with God. He prayed, usually to ask for favors or seek forgiveness when he knew he'd d done something wrong. He grew into a stereotypical teenager with a good heart, but who made dumb decisions at times like most of us did. When he was feeling particularly hurt one evening, he made a prayer request, as he had so many other times in his life. But at this point in time, he turned that request into an ultimatum. When his conditions weren't met by God, he turned around and walked away. As an 18-year-old, he 
moved through his life over the next few years, living quite rec recklessly. He dug himself to hole, into holes that he had no idea how to get out of. He built walls around his heart and around himself that separated him from love and he had no way of getting around them. In the midst of all his struggles, he found himself searching for meaning. He, as a sophomore in college, as a junior in college, dropped out of college, applied for an apprenticeship for the part-time job that he was working at, and dove headfirst into a life of party. When, a couple weeks after applying for the apprenticeship, he was denied the position, he hit an all-time low. He hoped to find some kind of peace, some kind of safety by uh, just throwing the biggest raging party he could come up with. And he thought he could drown himself in that lifestyle and in the drugs that accompanied it. So on the night that he, uh, that he and his friends threw this massive party, he did what everybody else was doing and the the drugs and everything else around him, the sadness inside him grew and the darkness that was already in him was fueled even more. In the midst of a bad trip, he contemplated suicide and he, in the middle of feeling the evils of the world trying to, and evils of, of Satan pulling at him, he knew that he needed something, he held his breath, cried out to God, and soon the world kind of went black to him. The next thing he remembered was standing in a flower bed in front of a funeral home. And this was hours later, but over the next, uh, the hours that happened after that and the days after that, he tried to make sense of the experiences that began at the funeral home, went to a church, ended up at a restaurant talking to police officers, and ultimately took him to the mental health unit in the nearest hospital. He moved home for a time, then he moved back to college, to the house that he was at, and sought to work while he was preparing to re-enroll in school. And it so happened at that point in time, there was a, uh, a young man who had just moved into the house that he was sharing with some friends that uh, had recently, in the process of his own struggles, come to know God and come to follow Jesus. He went to meetings for a campus ministry that had started recently on uh, SUNY Oswego's campus. He developed close relationships with Jesus followers and found answers in peace. Over time, he was pulled out of the holes that, that drugs and alcohol and so many other things had, uh, that he had dug for himself and the walls that he had built around his heart crumbled. He was discipled and his heart was touched. He committed his life to following Jesus. Pastors, ministry leaders, classmates, and friends took hold of him walked beside him, got messy with him, and compassionately shared the love and grace of God with him. He came home as a prodigal, a lost one, and God's people welcomed him with open arms. Those trying times were the biggest crossroads he had come to at that point in his life. But because of Christ's compassion and the willingness of believers to deeply love him and show that compassion, in spite of his past, in spite of his flaws, in spite of all the things that he had done, in spite of the fact that he had gone and squandered his life in so many ways, allowed him to grab hold of a new life in Jesus. The last time I spoke to him was about 20 years ago. At that point, he was in the last days of his life. He was saying goodbye to his friends and family, and he was preparing to be with his creator for the rest of eternity. At this crossroads, countless Jesus followers once again brought Christ's compassion. Church families held vigil in hospital hallways, old ministry leaders brought guitars into the rooms of sick people 
Sorry, you guys. <laughs> I knew I was going to get emotional. I hoped I wasn't going to get this emotional. <laughs> Old ministry leaders brought guitars into the rooms of sick people and filled the hospital wings with song and praises to God. Community members blessed his family with fellowship, with food, with resources, and most importantly, with compassion and love. We celebrated my father's life in the same church where I first heard his testimony when I was eight or nine years old. Where he explained his first real encounter with Jesus. My mother, my four siblings and I cried and laughed and listened and soaked up the love of God together with many others who, who attended his funeral. Christ's compassion was vividly on display. It was burned into my heart and mind by the countless Jesus, Jesus followers who were there, who met first my father at the crossroads and my family there too, and then have been there perpetually since. As a 19 year old, I was at a crossroads. I was hurting because of the loss of my father, anxious about how my family was going to move on, confused about what it looked like to live life without my dad. But again, I was immediately surrounded by the compassion of Jesus and, the, and Jesus' followers who were there to share my suffering with me, help strengthen me, and help strengthen my walk with God, and they remain there through this day. Because of Christ's compassion and because of Jesus' followers who were beside my father who got messy all those years ago, and because of those same types of people, and some, in some cases, some of those exact same followers, I'm able to be here today. In truth, that's why we're all here. Because of Christ's compassion. Because 2,000 years ago, he took it upon himself to become like us, but he sinlessly walked through the world and then gave his life so that we could be together with him. This is what we're meant to be. This is what we're meant to do. We're meant to get beside people. We're meant to get, get messy. We're meant to dig in and build strong relationships to show Christ's compassion. The first time I walked into Crossroads, a few years ago, I remember the feeling I got. Something deep down in my gut that let me know this place is a place where I'm supposed to be. And I couldn't totally explain it, but I remember driving in the car on the way home thinking that it felt like home. It felt like the the church and the body that I had grown up in that I had been missing for a long time. And I think that that gut feeling is, it plays directly into the concept of compassion and finding it at the crossroads of life. So my suggestion to all of you is to think and to feel and then to, to do, to get messy, to show that compassion and to extend yourself, as Jesus' example showed, to others and find those people at the crossroads of life, find people and, and extend that compassion completely to them. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the chance today to share some of my story, but also to uh, to use your word to help drive home an idea that uh, needs to be at the core of everything that we are, God. I thank you for your son and for his death on the cross that provides us with new life. 
I thank you for the, for the love that you showed for the, that stirring deep down inside that led you and led your son to give us the chance to be with you forever, God. Pray that you would uh, help open our eyes to see the hurt, to see the struggle, to see the poor, to see the needy, to see all those people in all those times in our world that uh, need more of your love and need more of your compassion. That you'd help us to extend ourselves and get beside those people that we would uh, not just look at our mission statement and congratulate ourselves for having a great mission, but that you would convict our hearts and push us to live out that mission, both in church and in our daily lives. Thank you for your body of believers that uh, have been there to support and help them to help us continue to support all those around us who are in need of help. And I pray that you would uh, bless our week and keep us, keep us looking constantly to you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. in his blood this is my story this is my song pleasing my savior all the day long this is my story This is my song, praising my Savior all the day. All is at rest 
I in my Savior am happy and blessed watching and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. my Savior all the day This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior my Savior all the day long. Thanks for joining us today. We hope to see you tonight at Parking Lot Praise at 6 o'clock. Um, we hope you have a blessed week and uh, just Hope that uh, the chance that you had to join us was one that ministered to you. And feel free to reach out to any member of our staff. You can go to our website and find out, uh, find out any connection that you need at any point in time. Have a great week.